This podcast is brought to you by Shorts TV and is not affiliated with the Oscars or the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in any way. Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Shorts TV podcast. I'm Carter Pilcher and I'm joined by the ever enthusiastic Rasha Goel. Well, Carter, it's always a joy to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's a great week to be enthusiastic, too, after a bunch of Oscar nominations just got named. Oh, yeah. I have to tell you, this is a great week for us. We have two new filmmakers on the podcast from the animation category, Madeline Sharafian and Mike Caparat, two not just filmmakers anymore, to Academy Award nominees, and they're the director and the producer of Burrow. That's right. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to watch Burrow yet, it's the story of a young rabbit who embarks on a journey to dig the burrow of her dreams, despite not having a clue of what she's doing. So rather than reveal to her neighbors and talk to them about her imperfections and insecurities, she digs herself deeper and deeper into trouble. And why do I have a feeling that perhaps many of us can relate to that at some point in our life? What a beautiful piece of filmmaking. Let's hear from the filmmakers. What an exciting time, Madeline and Mike, for both of you. Let's start off talking about the inspiration behind this story. What inspired you to create this animation for Burrow? There's sort of two pieces to it. There's like the visual inspiration and then the actual sort of story and theme. Because I'd sort of been holding on to this um, visual of a rabbit in a burrow from like way back even when I was in college. I sort of had it floating around as a potential student film idea. Like I was looking through old sketchbooks and I found one from 2014 that was like a little rabbit in a burrow kind of looking out. Um, so that had always been like a visual metaphor that I was that I was interested in, but it wasn't until I started working at Pixar and I had my sort of first couple of years here that were pretty difficult. The bar is so high here that when you're you're sort of young and you're new and you're just starting off, you don't want anybody to know that like that you're not that good yet. So instead of like maybe asking for deadline extensions because I took a little bit longer than some people, I would instead like, it's fine, it's fine, don't worry about it, and sort of like work <laughs> nights and weekends so that when I did pitch, it looked like I was like totally had it together and, and was already amazing. But what was really happening was that I was sort of digging myself into like a bad situation. That's a bit stressful. <laughs> it was stressful. I know it's a, it's a cute short, yeah. but <laughs> it comes from a real place. <laughs> it was kind of a bad, good situation because, it, because obviously you came out with some fabulous characters. Yes. I mean, that was the thing was that people would sort of offer help. Like Mike was my story manager on my first movie, Coco. And you would always right. offer me the option, Mike. Like Mike would offer me a way out and I would be like, no, I'm good. <laughs> I remember that from early days. Yeah, Maddie's first role at the studio was as a storyboard artist on Coco. I definitely remember Maddie getting in early. Like I would walk past her office and... I like to pride myself on getting there early you were and I'd early. see like the light on already and like a cup of coffee. I'm like, yeah. somebody's working early and then I'd leave and the light would still be on. Somebody's working late. Uh, <laughs> and there was always little nudges like, hey, do you need anything? And Maddie was like total trooper. And I think we all do that. Like when we start out new somewhere, it was like, you're really trying to yeah. prove yourself and show that you can do it, not just do it well, but do it on your own. Mm -hmm. And uh I don't know. I imagine that's sort of as like the seed for the theme of the movie that we I got to witness uh, without being aware that I was witnessing it. You were there. Uh, <laughs> I was there. Yeah. And with something like Burrow too, I'd love to hear more about the creative process for the both of you. You know, how long did it take you to create this from concept to actual full production? Even about how many seconds per day did you animate? Tell us a little. Talk to us a little bit about that process. Lindsay Collins was sort of the person in charge of kind of green lighting spark shorts at the time. And when she asked me if I had an idea, we are kind of aware that there's around two spark shorts that get made a year. And I had no idea how many other people she had asked, you know, like, would you like a spark short? So I, I came back to her 
by the next week with the concept for Burrow, which is why I sort of pulled from something from my back pocket, because I knew if I get myself in that door now, I have a chance of making a spark short this year. But if I wait too long, it might go to somebody else. So hmm. the story part of it happened pretty quickly. The first act one and act two stayed pretty much the same the whole time. Um, and even act three was just minor changes. I storyboarded it by myself uh, in a month. I storyboarded outside of the official Spark Shorts clock because Spark Shorts only have six months to be made. So I wanted to make sure I had the boards done before the clock started. Right. So once the clock started, mm. then we had three months for editing the, the short. The reels changed a little bit in there, but, but not too much. Uh, and then most of that three months was spent drawing all the backgrounds because we only had six, six people, I think, and they generated 106 backgrounds, wow. sort of just beautiful paintings that take a lot of time, but we tried to make sure that there, you know, there's a lot of times where it's just dirt in the short, so that's where we'd kind of like sneakily reuse, like this is actually the same dirt from before, but maybe you didn't notice. So we tried to be smart so that the, the talented artists could really just use their skills on like the, the beautiful stuff that we hold on to for a while. Right. And then three months of just, it's time to animate and how long did it actually take, Mike, do you think? We were go time. Yeah, we had one week um, of ramp up time where Maddie had, you know, done all of her homework to draw all the model sheets and all the prop sheets and hyper, mm -hmm. hyper detail, just knowing, okay, everybody, we're going to have one day where we do a drawing tutorial, and then yeah. you're going to get a week to kind of test out these characters. Yeah. And most of our animators are CG animators who haven't animated in 2D before, um, mm -hmm. and, and then we had to go. So it was like a week ramp up, and then probably start to finish close to two months two and a half months mm -hmm. um, i think that I think something that's like right. that P pretty intense but that's that's way more intense frankly than on a feature isn't it wouldn't you say i mean you well it's a lot shorter so <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's funny it's like there's a there's a lot of similarities in process between shorts and features um a lot of the processes are scaled down but i think one thing that maddie and i found you know just speaking about creative process that i think ended up being a huge lesson learned for us with, especially with 2D animation, mm -hmm. was that with this narrow timeline, with the look that Maddie was imagining, you know, from these, these cutout images of these beautiful detailed backgrounds, if we had to build out in 3D all of those assets, this thing would have probably taken five years to make. Yeah. So <laughs> wow. we ended up basically taking a lot of the departments that are normally separated out um, for like building CG assets and putting that into storyboards right where Maddie's basically like all of the backgrounds a lot of the key poses for the characters were pretty much baked in up front in the storyboards so that mm -hmm. the background painters knew exactly where to paint what to do it was very tight early on um, in mm -hmm. terms of its level of detail which I think yeah. was a really a huge win and a big shout out to Maddie for recognizing that early and for actually <laughs> executing it. Well, six months seems like a tight schedule, right? It's very tight. <laughs> One of the, the things that is amazing about your film, it, to have it made in six months, is just the number of sets that you have. You know, it's a... I know. You go from room to 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 room. And that's, and that's pretty amazing because when you look at other Spark shorts, a lot of times, you know, they have the same type of constraints, but they're in 3D, so they will just be in one set. Yeah. That was a fun part of the process, too, was early on identifying key shots and key sets. With a spark short, you got to kind of know up front as best you can where you're going to really spend your money and your energy on, like, paint, like right. going big on backgrounds and big on character stuff. And so we took Maddie's storyboards and mapped them out and basically started prioritizing shots in terms of complexity and, okay, this, this one we know is going to be on screen for a long time, so let's make sure we carve out time for this shot and that shot and this shot. And, uh, and that made a big difference. At Pixar, it is really some of the most important and creative place in terms of the development of the film. Can you talk about a little, just one more question on process, Maddie, and that is, can you tell us a little bit about the story process at Pixar? I'm sure it works on shorts and features. Mm -hmm. It's it's funny because it is, making a short is the miniature version of making a feature uh, story-wise. I think what 
the most successful films at Pixar that I've sort of been a part of and what I tried to stick with with Burrow is just a really simple concept that you're trying to get across paired with a really entertaining casing. You won't get too heavy handed with your theme if you're encasing it in something that's simply like delightful to look at. And then you can kind of sneak in, you know, the audience is having fun. And that's when you're like, ha ha, surprise. So uh, <laughs> a, a way that we try to work is with our storyboards first. This time we didn't have a team, but for the most part, it's done by a team of like 10 maximum artists who storyboard out, you know, very rough drawings, the whole movie that's like an hour and a half every time. Uh, and then we screen those reels for a group of people at Pixar. Sometimes it's the whole studio. Sometimes it's just a small group of people called the Brain Trust. And for Spark, we were allowed to, you know, make our reels and then pick our own Brain Trust. So Mike and I got to choose, you know, I included a bunch of my friends in story. There's some folks from edit. We tried to make sure that we had like a good mix of people. And then from there you get their notes and people uh, we've heard from, writers who come from outside Pixar. To us, we're used to it, but it, the notes can be very um, direct. And, and we just want to make sure that it's as good as it can possibly be. So people don't, they really don't hold back. And you're trusting them to not hold back. If they don't get the story or it's not developing the way they want, mm -hmm. how do they fix it? Do, you, do they ask you to tweak it or do they ask you to go back to the beginning or? Well, for Spark, there was no one who could really tell us to change everything. They tried to keep executive oversight out. So the people who we were getting notes from were not people who could tell us to start over. So we were lucky. Also, we didn't have the time <laughs> to start over. But, <laughs> but for the most part, uh, if there are big notes, it's not like they drop notes and then like run away and you're alone. Right. If there are really big notes that are difficult to tackle, the studio will find time to get the right people in the room to really, you know, take the hours that it will to at least start picking away at it. They're not going to leave you high and dry. Maddie and I have spent most of our careers in story at Pixar. And the, the big thing for me that I learned that I think is key to sort of maintaining quality control across the board is you, you touched on this, Maddie, but for a, a four year feature film, three of those years are spent in story. Mm -hmm. Over those three years, you screen the film in storyboard form, or, or at least some storyboards, eight times. And so each time you screen it fully storyboarded, wow. um, you get these notes, they come back, they pluck sequences to, to approve, to send down the pipeline to build in CG. But then you're right back, like you said, Matt, you're right back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I've always been impressed by that willingness to just, if it's not working, toss it and start over. And often it can go all the way back to like writing. If something's been almost animated, sometimes sequences, if they're not working, we'll just, they'll send them right back down the pipe and, and you have to start over. Yeah. Wow. So you definitely have to be willing to make those changes and be open-minded, right? Yeah. Madeline and Mike, so now that your film has been nominated, it will have a theatrical release across the United States with Shorts TV. Oh, what does that mean to you both? You know, especially given that the theaters have been pretty much closed during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, ah. we were lucky enough that we finished the short when Pixar was still in the building. So, you know, everybody was still out and about living their lives and we were able to hear audience reactions there. But that's still sort of a group of our friends and adults and peers. And what I'm really missing is like, I, I, you know, we make shorts for, so that we can enjoy them, but also this short in particular, I made sort of for like my childhood self of like exactly what I liked when I was a kid. And it's been like really breaking my heart that I can't listen to a theater full of kids watching this short. If I could just stand in the back and, you know, hear if they like it or not, that would like mean the world to me. Yeah. Or originally, like Maddie said, we were super excited that this was going to be released theatrically so that we could hear, you know, all the little kiddos reactions. And like, that was the reason, one of the big reasons we made this was just like to warm the, their little hearts. And uh, when we heard that it was going to be, have to be virtual, we were like, ah, it was a gut punch a mm -hmm. little bit, but then to, to then know like, okay, hang on a second. This is going out streaming on Disney Plus and it was on Christmas Day. I just, I think both of us realized like 
families are going to, you know, they're going to be opening presents in the morning. And then I don't know, our family tradition in the afternoon is to hang out and watch movies. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how special is that to, to be released, you know, for that crowd on that day with that vibe for, for that, that group. I was just, I, I feel like that is such a blessing for this film. It's something that came out of this, that maybe one little shining light out of this hard time. Mm -hmm. Both of you have such incredible careers. Um, the films that you both have worked on at Pixar. For filmmakers that are listening, what's a piece of advice you could give to them? Maybe if someone is already in animation or even starting out and has a dream of coming and being a part of the Pixar team at some point in their life. Yeah, I think my, my favorite piece of advice that I found like really, really served me well was that I, I didn't wait for a green light to make things. I made sure that if I had an idea, I didn't sort of tuck it away and sit and, and, and wait too long before I made something because the more that I put out into the world, the more confidence I could build that I, I had a voice and I knew how to tell things. I knew how to create something that had a beginning and a middle and an end. And that came in the form of my short films at school, but also even just on like comics on the side, like just building up your own confidence that you can make something and finish it and make it exactly your taste so that if you do get the chance, if you are like sort of offered that door kind of like I was, I didn't hesitate too much to jump for the opportunity because I, I had already proven to myself that I, that I could handle it. And if I didn't know that, I might not have been, you know, so, so bold to assume that I, I could take on a spark short. That's great. Mike? Yeah, it's funny because I think Maddie's short films from school are like so fantastic and it's easy to walk away from, I think those movies and say like, anybody can make a, a short film on their own. Like Maddie killed it with these short films and it exists, they're like start to finish, she made it by herself and they're amazing. And I think the, the thing for me that I realized and, and was definitely reinforced by this experience was like, it is richer and I think can lead to a more like a fulfilling experience as a filmmaker to reach out and connect with other people. I think that was the big thing for me coming in as a new person at Pixar was like really trying to, to put myself out there and, and network internally and just meet people and say, say what you're interested in. And people want to help. Most people think like, you know, oh, I don't want to bother them or, you know, they're too busy and, if you reach out, I think most people are flattered that, you, that you're seeking out their opinion and help. And, and, and then, you know, when we ended up making this film, all those connections, a lot of them came back into play because we were able to lean on those relationships. Like, hey, we're making something you want in. Mm -hmm. And people were like, yeah, it's you, you know? Yeah, that's great fun. What would you say in terms of moving from being a part of a great big department at Pixar to actually running your own team and producing your own movie. I think it's like going off of a, you going off of a low, a, a low dive for a long time and somebody says, go to the high dive and you go, <laughs> okay, oh yeah. my goodness, <laughs> yeah. this is not what I expected. Well, it's funny because I, on one hand, it was very new to me because I had never been in charge of any number of people before. I had made things, but I, those were 100% alone. I knew that I could make a short film and I knew how to do it in 2D with the program, but I only knew how to do it by myself. So for me, the thing that I was worried about was not, can we make the film? Can we make the short? Is it gonna work? It was more like, are we gonna have a happy team? What if everybody hates us? Like, what? how are we gonna keep people happy? and healthy because a lot of the time people coming onto your short are really exhausted because they're coming right off of a feature that's right. kind of run them ragged. And when you have a short timeline like we do, the last thing you want is to just make their lives harder. It is the difference between two dives, but it's still like, you know, a pool. Like I, I you know, I've, I've seen a pool before. So it really was just, okay, the stakes are a little <laughs> higher. And if I mess this up, people might be mad at me as opposed to before where it was like, it's just me. If I mess up, that's, you know, I probably <laughs> deserved it, but this is like, there's people here who don't deserve it. They deserve the best, <laughs> which was part of why I picked Mike for my yeah. producer. Cause I knew if there's anybody who can make a team like happy and healthy, it would, it would be Mike. By picking Mike, I tried to make that diving board, like boop, just that little bit, like <laughs> less tall and scary. 
I think having each other through that process was a really big deal because we've we've had you know models to follow on our experience on feature films. We've worked for producers and directors, and they you know oversee these huge groups of people. And everybody does talk about like that closed door meeting between the director and the producer being this like sacred time where you can talk for real, like, okay, how did that actually go? (laughs) Those are some of the, my favorite times too, on this production was getting to, to hang out with you, Maddie, and really like, okay, we just had a meeting full of animators in a room looking at a ton of shots our inventory pipeline is chock full we can't back out now they were so quiet what do we do they were so quiet Mike. is that okay (laughs) and we just being able to talk it out always go back to like what's right for the story like what do we what do you want to say here maddie I, i think you're right like the big question we kept asking is like how do we keep this crew happy and healthy so that Mm -hmm. the end product is as happy and healthy as they are like if you give them the space to make something awesome uh, it's going to be awesome. That one-on-one director-producer time, I think, in terms of going off the high dive, is a biggie. Yeah. <laughs> I know we're probably getting close to wrapping up here, but you know something that came to mind as you both were speaking is that the world of animation, and I'm sure, Carter, you can attest to this, having been a member of the Academy for so many years, it has really changed. And from an outsider perspective, I feel like it's also become very, it's a competitive playing ground. So on a personal level especially for filmmakers, animation filmmakers who are listening, how do you overcome an insecurity you may have? Because at some point we're all artists, right? And there is that moment of, am I good enough? Or how am I going to do this? For both of you, I'd love for you to just share a brief insight on how do you overcome your insecurities? I know exactly what you mean. (laughs) And I think whenever you're making something, there's that initial first feeling of just like, it's just you and yourself. And it's just like me and my sketchbook and I've drawn a rabbit in a burrow and I have that like little flash of like, oh yeah, that's so good. That's exactly what I wish I could see. And I don't know if I've seen something quite like it. That's so cool. And then as as you continue to work, your opinion of your idea is just gonna go only down from there. And there's always a moment in the middle, like guaranteed that you're like, this idea is stupid and I was dumb for even thinking that I could and I should. <laughs> but I think the more you do it, the more you just need to remember that like, when you first had that idea, you knew it was good and you don't think it's good anymore, but that idea hasn't changed. So you just have to push through until it's finished. And by the time you're done, hopefully you'll end up right back here and you'll you'll know that like, that idea that you initially had was is still good. It's still there. Only your opinion has changed in the middle. You kind of just have that. to fake it till you make it. <laughs> and Mike? I think for me, my biggest confidence dip always comes when I am in a room full of 115 people like looking to me for direction <laughs> in a an animation meeting where there's 115 animators and they're like, okay, they're all quiet. What are we yeah. doing? <laughs> and everybody's quiet and has their arms crossed. They're all very nice people, but that's a lot of eyeballs. Being comfortable enough or just not even comfortable enough, just forcing yourself to be vulnerable in front of that group and say, hey, look, I don't know for sure if this is right. This is my best guess. And showing your work as best you can, like, here's how I kind of think we should go. I always found that those leaders uh, were the ones who I wanted to work hard for. They're just like you. They're trying to figure it out and being okay saying, I am human too, and I don't know the right answer, but we're going to go for it anyway and figure it out together. That that always helped me because nine times out of 10, people are like, that's okay. We'll, we'll figure it out together. I love that. I love that. Carter, anything else? Yeah. Well, I think that's a great point to end on. Just the idea that two important points. One is being humble is actually a sign of confidence. And the other, that in the middle of a lack of confidence, you just have to keep going forward. And I I think that in certainly in storytelling and probably in life too, you know, those are really amazing lessons. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you both. Thank you so much. We are excited for your film and um, we're rooting for you and and yeah, wishing you the best. Yeah. Thank you for having us. That means a lot. 
Carter, how wonderful were these two? You know, it was so incredible to hear about the inner workings at Pixar. I have to say, I was completely fascinated. And I love the fact that such a reputed company is giving so much importance to short films. And now that they've been nominated, I'm even happier that, well, like Mike said, the kiddos out there will get to see their movie in the cinema. And Rasha, just like you said, hats off to Pixar and to Spark Shorts. Another year, another nomination, amazing track record for Pixar. And Rasha, speaking of kids seeing movies in theaters, well, we also got to catch up with the artistic director of the Sun Valley Museum of Art, Christine Bertal, over in Ketchum, Idaho. Christine Bertal has been programming the Oscar-nominated short films for years. Christine, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about Ketchum. So we are a, about a 100-plus-year-old town in the mountains of Idaho. Many people may know us from Sun Valley, which is the ski resort that's located here. started in the 30s by Averill Harriman of the Union Pacific. There's a great history here. But we've also got a great arts community here, and I happen to work at the Sun Valley Museum, and so we throw, show films in addition to having wonderful curated shows here in our in our walls. And speaking of films, you've also been very helpful and uh, responsible for bringing in short films to the Magic Lantern Cinema. We have. We've been doing that for uh, six years now. We've been teaming up with the Magic Lantern to show the Oscar shorts to our community, and it's gotten to be so popular that we've had to add screenings every year. And so we've done two screenings a day for each of the programs over the last couple of years. And people just are so excited to be able to see the Oscar shorts because for so many of us, myself included, you, the Oscars always come around and you see these categories and you have never had the chance to see these films. We're still bringing the Oscar shorts this year a little bit later. Yep. They're coming out on the 2nd of April. How about folks in Ketchum? Are they going to be ready for us? People are really ready. People have been asking me. And I think, again, because of COVID and because of the lockdown, that we've all sort of lost track of so many things in terms of dates and times and when things happen. And so, you know, the change of the dates for the Oscar presentations, I think people aren't even really clued into the fact that Normally, we would, would have already seen the Oscars by now, but I was just the other day, I was up skiing, and I, as, as you do here on a sunny spring day, we stopped for beers, and a couple beers into my beers, the ski patrol comes by and says, <laughs> either you're skiing down now, because this is the last time the ski patrol can kind of chase you down, or you have to just take the gondola down at the end of the day and you can continue to drink your beers. And so we made the wise decision to keep drinking our beers and not take the gondola down. And then he did a double take and said, and this is a ski patrol guy. He says, you know, well, wait a minute. We're not going to get the Oscar shorts this year, are we? And I said, well, why would you say that? And he said, well, I mean, we haven't seen them. And I said, no, no, we're, we're doing them. We just scheduled them and they're happening in April. And he said, oh my God, it's my very favorite thing to see. I love the Oscar shorts and we never miss them. And so Aww. I'm so excited I ran into you and I'm so glad that you're doing them. So I love that. I love yeah. hearing that. What a great story. But it shows you the impact, right, that these films have. And I think that's Absolutely. what's phenomenal. Christine, even in this past year, though, what kind of an impact do you think the pandemic has had when it's come to screening films? Because obviously, you know, we've all had to kind of go online and experiences virtually. So I'd love to hear from your perspective. How do you think that's impacted what you do and even in this coming year? Absolutely. So... We have, you know, just like everybody, this is kind of the anniversary of our lockdowns and we couldn't do any screenings and we do screenings certainly outside of the Oscar shorts. In the past years, we've done screenings about once a month of documentary films and then again in February, always do the shorts as part of our overall film program. We did no screenings whatsoever in the spring, of course, and then starting in the fall, we really wanted to get back to having screenings and so we chose to go back kind of hard and we've done Thursday night screenings all fall long into December, took off about three weeks and then starting again in January have done weekly screenings 
And it's been touch and go, I'll tell you, that people have been nervous to come back to the theater. People that have been coming back are so grateful and they're so happy to be in a theater and they're so happy to be seeing a film the way films are meant to be seen. I mean, at the end of the day, we, of course, we can see things on whatever screen we want, but an immersive screen experience is the best and it's fantastic and it's just not equaled in any other way. I will tell you also that it's been fun. We have a lot of children's programs at our museum and we've screened a number of shorts for our students this spring and that's been a real joy that we um, have showed, you know, a number of shorts that have been, I know, part, I'm sure part of Oscar's shorts over the years. And the kids are so, so into them. And it's been really, really fun. And we screen them at our theater. Um, so again, up on a big screen where they get to sit in the theater seats, all, all eight of them in a giant theater. And it's just, it's a joy. It's a joy to share those films. Well, that is fantastic, Christine. Well, let me just say one more time, because in case somebody is coming, they're living in New York and they're headed out to Sun Valley to ski at yes. the beginning of April. Yes. Magic Lantern Cinemas from... We always show them sort of consecutively. On April 8th, we'll be doing live action. Okay. On April 15th, we'll be doing animated. And then on April 22nd, we'll be doing the doc shorts. And we do, again, two screenings on each day. So we'll do like a 4.30 screening and a seven o'clock screening. So if I, if I can just suggest to our audience that if they haven't mm -hmm. booked a winter ski trip, they should be booking one now to Sun Valley. Eighth, if you want live action. Fifteenth, if you want the animations. And the twenty-second, if you want the doc. I'm going to try to be timing. there for all three. And if you if you <laughs> if you come, Rasha and Carter, we'll sit up there on the deck of the historic Roundhouse Building, right in the middle of the mountain. Yes. Seventy-five hundred feet, and drink gigantic beers or Aperol spritzes or whatever you want. It's a full bar. Fantastic. I, I appreciate that. I'm coming. I, I want to be there. I love it. Fantastic. Love it. <laughs> what a fun story, Carter. I mean, I mean, what a great note to end our episode on. Okay, so Carter, question: Can we go to Idaho now? Okay, we can't go to Hawaii, so we're definitely going to yes. Idaho. I think we've got to go to catch yes. them. People are starting to get geared up for the Oscar shorts, and you know, this was our first interview of an actual nominee of a nominated film for On the Road to the Oscars. And what is absolutely so exciting is that right now we're in the final countdown and on the 2nd of April, the Oscar shorts are going into theaters like Ketchum, Idaho, and a lot more all across the country. I cannot wait. So mark your calendars, that's April 2nd. Now that's it for this week, but please do join us next time to hear from more nominees and get all the inside information that you'll need to win your Oscar pool. And that's absolutely correct. And keep listening to this podcast because we're going to give away any little hint we find only to you guys. So spread the word about the Church TV podcast, subscribe, and don't miss a single second.